unmistakable signs that Mars was a wet place. And now there's even more information from NASA's twin rovers that roam the red planet, taking pictures and probing the rocks for their chemical makeup. The photos reveal clear sedimentary layers in the Martian rocks. And chemical analysis shows they must have been laid down in the presence of water. Mars might be too cold and dry to harbor life today. But if water was once there, then perhaps life was too. And now there's hope that life may thrive even farther out in the solar system. I think Mars is the number one candidate for the search for life beyond the Earth, especially if we're going to find it soon. But we do have a backup plan. And in this case, the backup plan is Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter. A little smaller than our moon, Europa is covered with ice. But there are cracks in its surface, perhaps signs of ice sheets floating on a deep ocean of liquid water. What might be melting the ice is internal friction, created by the gravity of Jupiter and its other moons. Europa's ocean is suddenly considered a potential home for life. The places where life can live and exist are far more extensive than we used to imagine. We used to think a life-bearing planet had to be just like the Earth. And a little closer to the sun, it would be too hot. A little farther away, it would be too cold. And now we realize, oh, gosh, there's a place which has an ocean with three times as much water as the ocean of Earth. And the water's warm. And that's way out in the solar system, where we used to think the temperatures were ridiculously low. There could never be life there. So the likelihood of life existing on planets and spaces has just gone up enormously. So even though we've yet to find life elsewhere in the solar system, or beyond, we're getting more optimistic that life may be widespread. But if life is common in the galaxy, what kind of life would it be? Is it merely the kind of life we had here for about three billion years? microorganisms happily brewing away, with nothing bigger or more interesting than bacteria? Or is it the complex plant and animal life we find in our oceans, of all shapes and sizes? Or could it be what SETI is banking on, intelligent life that builds cities, computers, and radio transmitters? We now know that the way we got to this from something like this was through evolution. Does that mean evolution would work the same way wherever life appears? Frank Drake thinks so. Once you have life, evolution goes to work. Life is very opportunistic. It expands, it finds ways to survive, it finds ways to cope with changing environments. And in the process, it becomes more intelligent. And in the long run, you end up with something like us, exploiting technology to live in even more inhospitable habitats. Drake's optimism shows up in the estimates he's plugged into his own equation. His guess is that wherever life arises, it will evolve into intelligent life 10% of the time. Not quite inevitable, but a fairly common outcome. It's hard to know how likely or common intelligence is when it's shown up so recently in Earth's history. So the short history goes like this. Life early, but the familiar life that we think of, plants and animals, that is really a relatively recent development on this planet. And intelligent life, people like ourselves, technologically competent humans, that's just a snap in the full history of the planet. After about three billion years with only microscopic life, Earth finally became home to true plants and animals. And after another five or six hundred million years, we came along. One of the major mechanisms for all these changes has been DNA, the 
long chain of molecules that carries the blueprint for every living thing. Every time a cell divides, its DNA makes a copy of itself. And in that copy, there are often some mistakes. Sometimes those mistakes result in an animal or plant that's more successful than its parents. It's these kinds of mistakes that have allowed the tree of life to branch out in so many directions, creating the great diversity we see on our planet. So if there's life on other planets, does it have to have DNA? Would aliens have DNA? Well, I would be surprised to find aliens with DNA as their heredity because DNA is a useful molecule. It can replicate, it can do the mirror image bit, it can do the... It, it's a very useful trick, but other chemicals can do that. And I'd be surprised if aliens latched onto the same one that we did. To get from microbes to complex animals and intelligent life, you might not need DNA. But there's one ingredient that could be absolutely crucial for the evolution of intelligence. And it may be the rarest of all, time. Some scientists say that the key to our evolution was Earth's long and relatively peaceful history. Among them is paleontologist Peter Ward. In this big galaxy of ours, hundreds of billions of stars, surely Earth is repeated many places, many times, why, and why not? Well, I think that the question is how much time do we have? For instance, we got to intelligent organisms on this planet after 500 million years of animal life. So you've got a long period of time. Now, that doesn't say you couldn't get it sooner in other places, but you still need finite periods of time. And to me, that is the major argument against there being intelligent civilizations. You can't go from a bacterium to an intelligence in a million years, maybe not even 10 million years, probably not even in 100 million years. How many other planets are going to have such long periods of time? Not many, I think. In the half billion years when intelligence was evolving, Earth's plant and animal life might have been pushed back to square one. Single-celled organisms with one catastrophic event. At least a couple of times, we came pretty close. This crater, about a mile across, was made by a meteor that plunged to Earth nearly 50,000 years ago. As violent as that event must have been, it was nothing compared with earlier catastrophes. Just ask the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs ruled Earth for about 150 million years. They had the size, they had the power. It seemed that nothing could stop them. Then, 65 million years ago, an asteroid about six miles across headed toward Earth. In the aftermath of a collision of epic proportions and widespread volcanic eruptions, as many as two-thirds of all living species were wiped out. The big guys didn't stand a chance. Among the survivors were little mammals, and with the dinosaurs conveniently out of the picture, they thrived. 